order. Um, this is Tuesday, April 7th, and this is the uh, joint work session of the Oregon City Commission and the uh, Planning Commission. Um, before, actually, let's do roll call. Um, I'm Alice Norris, the mayor. Doug Neely, City Commission. Daphne West, Commission President. Tim Powell, Planning Commission. Carter Stein, Planning Commission. Rocky Smith, City Commission. Dan Rutland, the Development Director. I'm Doug McClain, Planning Commission. Chris Groner, Planning Commission. Mary Patterson, City Manager. And back here. Uh, Judy Clark, Team HR. Jim Leffler, HR Director. Scott Archer, Community Services Director. Nancy Eyed, City Recorder. And back here. Uh, Colin Miner, Oregonian. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, first of all, before we begin, get right into the reserves process, I just want to say thank you to the Planning Commission for your work. Uh, you devote so many volunteer hours and you've been in the hot seat for some incredibly sensitive and important work that we've been involved in and I just want to thank you for your hours that you've put in your expertise and your ability to um, maintain your perspective while those around you may not be. So um, again, <laughs> appreciate that. Thank and you. I look, they've had some very contentious <laughs> hearings. In other words, and I um, look forward to this process together. Um, and we probably should do it more often, but it's uh, often a scheduling thing. And Dan Lajoie, the uh, Planning Commission, has just walked in. Okay, let's move on. Who do I turn this over to? Dan Brentlaw to um, start off the urban rural reserves process. Okay, um, I want to point out a few things in your packet. This is a really detailed and comprehensive topic. A lot of information. So, uh, what I thought I'd do is first uh, go over a general overview of the packet, the information you have, and then I'm going to turn it over to Doug McLean, who's the planning director of Clackamas County, and he's going to talk about the county process and, and where they're at in this whole reserves discussion. Uh, if, if we refer to your, does it? Does everyone have their packet? I wanted to point out the which, uh, which is which is the packet. It's, which the, one? it's the first item. After your agenda for the work session, this it's one? the candidate reserve areas. Yeah, that's part of it. The the first it's the, the first, first page, page. Yes. item agenda item two a is a brief summary of this is the uh, memo from Clackamas County and it's a brief summary of uh, some of the factors that were used to define these urban and rural reserves and I'm not going to get into any details now but I just wanted to point those out. Uh, it should be yes, should have been the in the packet. Yep. It's the first page, page in the book. Page. Yep. There that you go. <laughs> yeah, following that, and again we'll get back to these in some more detail. Uh, following that is a list of the public hearings that are coming up on this whole reserves topic uh, that the county is sponsoring. And then following that is something I want to briefly get into, and that's the twenty and fifty year uh, forecast for population. This uh, this process of urban reserves involves a 50-year look into the future on what areas around the, the Portland me metro area should be urbanized and what areas should, should remain rural. And uh, this is a really important piece of the equation, how much growth are we going to have and how are we going to accommodate the growth. So uh, this draft population that's actually been released in March of both, again, the 20 and 50 year numbers um, is the basis for these discussions. The 20 year forecast you're seeing in there relates to the urban growth boundary expansion. If you'll remember, that's a 20 year land supply that Metro looks at, and that analysis occurs every five years, with the exception of this past uh, process, which uh, the Metro asked uh, for a two year extension, so they're on a seven year horizon. So in 2010, we'll be looking at a, another UGB ex expansion. But again, that's based on a 20-year uh, uh, projection, and that's why this is based on a 20-year. And the 50-year, again, is this longer-range urban versus rural reserves um, uh, issue. So if you look at page one on your handout related to the forecast, you can see that uh, the population forecast is, is done for the uh, Portland and Vancouver PMSA. Uh, and that includes Columbia, Clark, Skamania, Clackamas, Washington, Yamhill, and Multnomah County. So it's the whole uh, metropolitan region. 
There's a lot of details in here. I'm just going to, again, skim through these, and if you have questions, uh, uh, feel free to ask. I think the next most important uh, summary is on page five, and you can see, again, on table one, they've done a, both a low and a high end range for this forecast. So you can see for the year 2000, we're just over 1.9 million people in the metro area. In 2030, which again is the planning horizon for our next UGB expansion, you see a range there. One is 2.9 million and the upper range 3.2 million. You can see that the uh, annual rate increase for the low is 1.37% annually and for the high end 1.7%. And then you can see in 2060, they're assuming a bit lower uh, growth rate. <clears throat> those, those numbers are 3.6 million at the low end, and for uh, the high end, almost 4.4 million people. So that's over doubling of what we have, have today. So that's the need to look for additional areas to either uh, expand or to go up in densities or some combination thereof. And I think the next thing I'd point out is on page 8, and these are the uh, employment forecasts. And you can see again that they've done a high and a low range. And if you look at the graph at the bottom of page 8, you can see uh, those high and low projections. And you can see there's a pretty significant gap there. Uh, and I think part of that is just the uncertainty or difficulty of predicting employment, especially uh, during these tough economic times. If you look at the next page on page 9, that employment forecast is split up into um, some standard employment sectors, um, manufacturing, construction, wholesale, retail, transportation, information and financial services, education, leisure and hospitality and government. And you can see that <clears throat> on the bar graphs, some trends that probably aren't too surprising. You can see manufacturing, manufacturing uh, actually employment levels dropping in, as we move towards 2030, construction dropping, wholesale and retail trade in <coughs> increasing, um, and also increasing areas in information and financial services education and health, and then uh, leisure and government. And you'll notice some of those jobs, especially those in retail and leisure and hospitality, are, are lower paying jobs, so that's something that we really have to be concerned about. And also, um, the government jobs are, are increasing, but again, that has an effect on our tax base because they're not uh, sales tax, or I mean income tax producing, or property tax. So um, they are, let's clarify yeah. that, they are income yes. tax producing. Yes, right, but correct. they are not property tax. Correct. Because they're often exempt. Now, this is really quick, and uh, we can go back to this if you'd like. But the other thing I wanted to point out is on, uh, I handed out a memo that has the uh, heading of City of Oregon City on it. Should have been at your place. Does everyone have that? Chris yes, to Chris Steffenbach from Metro and Maggie Dickerson from Clackamas County. And this is an analysis of <clears throat> our own population and employment projections that we conducted in the planning department. And uh, I think the, the, the only thing I wanted to point out at this point is that if we took all our vacant land and if we took all our uh, urban growth area, and again, those are those three areas, the Park Place area, Beaver Creek, and the South End Road area. And we built all of those out. We would accommodate a population of 45,763. And today we're just over 30,000. So that gives you a pretty good idea of what sort of capacity we have with our existing uh, city limits and urban growth boundary. <clears throat> That's based on current zoning. Well, thanks for the segue. If you go to <laughs> if you go to the next chart, it, it, it has a header. It says Oregon City Population Projection. It's this uh, with all the neat lines in here. 
that, that full page table, you can see, um, if you go to the top, it says 2008 population, 30,405. That's today's population. <coughs> and what I did is I assumed an annual growth rate of 1.535%, and that is the average of Metro's high and low forecasts. So that's why I picked that number. Okay. And if you run that out to the year 20, about where are we? 2035, you'll see we're at 46,579. That's about our build out population. So if we assume we're growing at uh, the metro rate and we assume all our land gets built on, we'll be out of land by 2035. So one logical conclusion is, is that maybe we don't need a significant increase in, in the 20 year supply. But when you look at the 50-year horizon, which is the whole urban reserves question, we do need more capacity. And again, that's just based on these growth the assumptions. Confused. The front page says uh, the whole <coughs> build out would be 38,545 people on, on page one. And then you turn this to 2035, did I hear that right? 2036. I'm sorry, Doug. I'm the first sure page, the last sentence last of the sentence. first page says uh, our population in full build out would be 38,545. Uh, that's without the urban growth areas. Oh, well, uh, the current ones we've got. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's I got why you it's now. a lower number. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think that's a whirlwind sort of tour of the background on, on some of this. Um, and I'll, now I think I'll turn it over to Doug. We'll talk a little bit about the county's process. Um, thanks. Again, for those of you I haven't met, I'm <coughs> Doug McLean. I'm the county's planning director. Um, I've been at this for about 30 years. So um, this is, though, I think far and away the most interesting project we've done for a long time. Um, the idea that we're going to start planning for growth um, on a 50-year horizon is pretty ambitious. Uh, what I'm going to do in a hopefully about 10 or 15 minutes is kind of let you know what the urban and rural reserves project is all about and also describe to you where we are. Uh, Dan's done a good job of setting the table and at least kind of explaining the challenge we have in this region, um, you know, and it's, it's all about growth management planning. You do that every day as planning commissioner or mayor or uh, city council person. Um, that's, a, that's a big focus of what you've been doing, but um, the magnitude that's, that's indicated in the population and employment forecast is a little bit, ex a little bit staggering. In 50 years, we're going to double our population. What are we going to, what are we going to do with them? Uh, where are we going to, where are we going to put all these people? And that's the conversation we're attempting to have. Uh, and the idea behind doing urban and rural reserves is to look at, the, look at that question on a long-term basis and maybe kind of break out of this cycle we've had in the last um, few decades of having to adjust the urban growth boundary every five years, do little incremental adjustments, argue about each parcel of land, Instead, try and look at this, make the decision one time based on a 50-year horizon, establish those areas where we think um, we may in the future expand the urban growth boundary, um, and at the same time decide uh, those areas that are, and pick out those areas that are the most important uh, as far as preserving farmland, forest land, and natural landscape features and set those aside and say, for the next 50 years, we're not going to go there. Um, and that's very different from the way we've done things in the past. We've always made these incremental decisions about where are we going to go for the next 20 years every five years. So it's like, it's like painting the Golden Gate Bridge. You finish the job and turn around and start going back the other way. And this is an attempt to kind of break out of that cycle a little bit and add a little more definition uh, on a long-term basis. It's not with the expectation that this initial decision won't be hard because it will and it'll be controversial and it already is, um, but it's something that maybe we can do once and uh, be a little more logical and a little less controversial in the future decisions we make. So that's the idea here. A couple other things uh, as far as the timing of this project is concerned. Um, we're trying to complete the urban and rural reserves 
project by the end of this year. Um, that's pretty ambitious. Uh, we've been at it for two years, but the idea is that we want to get that designation process done um, because it will inform the mm -hmm. obligation that Metro has to decide whether or not to expand the urban growth boundary, and if so, where. Uh, the idea is that if we've picked out urban reserves, um, we'll only be looking at area lands within those urban reserves should the boundary uh, need to be expanded in 2010. So that's the urgency for doing this particular project in a timely way. Um, <coughs> I'm going to pass out um, a frequently asked questions about urban and rural reserves just so you can look at them. I'm not going to re review them because I don't want to spend the rest of the night um, talking about this, so I'll try and just, just hit some of the high points. Um, the other thing that I want to talk about, uh, some of you have heard this before, but I'll reiterate it, is kind of the de what I call the decision-making architecture because it's very unique. It's very different. Um, the state law was changed uh, in the last session to provide us this opportunity, and as a part of that, there's a very particular um, decision-making architecture that's described. Among other things, what it, what it requires is that Metro and the three counties, Washington, Multnomah, and Clackamas, agree on these designations. So we have to actually sign intergovernmental agreements um, with each county has to sign an intergovernmental agreement with Metro where uh, both parties agree that the rural reserve and urban reserve designations are acceptable. Um, we've had a lot of this coordination uh, over the years, but never, I don't think, a requirement to actually agree on it. And if we don't agree, it doesn't get done. So that's also a fairly ambitious uh, objective for this region, but one, I think, so far, the fragile coalition has kind of hung together. It hasn't uh, come apart yet, but um, the proof's in the pudding, and we're just now starting to draw lines on the map, so obviously the um, level of uh, the conversation has gone up several decibels, but we'll see how that works. Um, each local government has, each county has its own way of uh, approaching this project. Uh, actually, in Clackamas County, we created a policy advisory committee uh, that is comprised of 21 members. Um, they're a combination of citizen representatives. Doug Neely has been serving on the um, policy advisory committee. Um, <laughs> they're also uh, neighborhood group representatives, hamlets, and our community planning organizations. Uh, there's seven cities and seven community planning organizations. And then we have a, a, um, also a group of citizens representing various interests, farm community, the home builders. Uh, we have somebody from the Clackamas River Basin Council. We have, so we have kind of a broad-based committee that's been uh, working on identifying uh, urban and rural reserves. And they've been at it for, gosh, 18 months now, I guess, almost, um, for a while anyway. Maybe it's a year. And it seems like forever, I think, Doug, but it's, but it, it's been hard work. Um, with a lot of information to digest and a lot of tough decisions that uh, need to be made, which um, brings me to where we are right now. Um, we've spent, uh, again, probably a year sort of being acquainted, uh, understanding what those factors are that you've, you've seen, uh, and also beginning to actually draw the lines on the map. Um, and I've tried to describe this a number of different ways, but the best thing I can say is that this is very much an iterative process. So we're drawing the lines on the map with the understanding that we're going to bring the map back out uh, every every meeting almost to look at it again with new information that's being submitted and additional analysis and additional work and so that's continuing to occur. It's important to understand that the Policy Advisory Committee's role is to make a recommendation to the Clackamas County Board of County Commissioners. It's actually the Board of County Commissioners who has to enter into the agreement with Metro and it's the Board of County Commissioners ultimately who has to adopt in Clackamas County both the rural and urban reserve designations. So um, the Policy Advisory Committee's role is as a recommending body. Um, the Clackamas 
County Coordinating Committee, C4 it's called, also has been involved in this conversation and has been updated and has voiced its concerns and objectives. Uh, we also have um, a number of agencies and uh, interest groups that have been involved. The Clackamas County Economic Development uh, Commission has uh, done a number of presentations on employment land needs, that kind of thing. Um, so there's a lot of activity, a lot of information to digest. Um, Today, uh, we are at the point of having um, proposed candidate urban and rural reserves. So we started out um, the initial phase of this project identifying a study area which was approximately five miles from the existing urban growth boundary and included 400,000 acres of uh, land. That's almost twi a little little almost exactly twice as much as the land that's inside the existing urban growth boundary. So it's a big area to study. Um, over the last year, we've been trying to kind of whittle down that area, take areas out, and that's where we are now. We're at the point of having um, identified some candidate urban and rural reserves for additional study and review. And this is where I'll go up to the maps and do a little uh, show and tell. Okay, thank you. Um, and I'm going to I'm going to skip the informational maps and go directly to um, two maps. Um, first, what we call the candidate urban reserve map, and the way the um, Policy Advisory Committee made the recommendation and the information that we used was based primarily on a serviceability analysis. So the, um, the project management and staff people went out, talked to all of the service providers that provide sewer and water and said, okay, if you're trying to figure out on a 50-year horizon which areas are easiest to serve, um, where are they, and which are the worst uh, as far as suitability to serve, and kind of what's the medium. So we ranked them, high, medium, and low. Um, the, what the Policy Advisory Committee um, did was consider maps that put those sewer and water facilities um, information together and created a composite and ranked them, again, high, medium, and low. And then we have an exception to that, too. So I'm going to confuse you, but I'm, I'm going to do this anyway. Um, the areas that you see in, and I'm sorry about colors. Uh, I never am very good at describing these. But I call this dark gold. That's where I come down to. Um, so the dark gold hatched areas um, on this map were areas that were ranked as easiest to provide sewer and water to. Okay, and you can see that those are the areas generally that have been shaded and are recommended as candidate urban reserves. Um, if you look at the Oregon City area, you know, the area that is a candidate urban reserve is the area that's out here in the, um, in the Holcomb area east of the city and a small area here uh, adjacent on the south. Uh, so those are the those are the two areas that we're going to continue to look at. Um, now, the the um, other the other colors here show a sort of tan, light tan area, for want of a better term. Um, that's the area that's most difficult to provide sewer to, and has either a very difficult low rating for water or a medium rating for water. And then the sort of medium colored tan is the area that's in between those two. It's, uh, it's medium in the rating for sewer and medium or high for water. Um, then we have these two odd green areas. Those are areas that uh, are either high for water and low for sewer or low for, wa or low for high for sewer and low for water. They're, they're very different. So. Um, we used this information, information on transportation uh, suitability. We reviewed a lot of other information, including topography and um, just general site suitability information, and um, identified these candidates for urban reserves. We also did a similar kind of analysis for candidate rural reserve areas. And this is a regional map, so it's a different scale. Um, but the 
green, light green area is the area that is um, being considered as candidates for uh, rural reserves. And you can see that some of the same area that is identified as a candidate for an urban reserve is also identified as a candidate for a rural reserve. And that's something that will get suited out or sorted out with additional analysis and work. In Clackamas County, not much of the study area was removed from consideration. Mostly it's a large area in the um, southeast corner of the property or the study area. So that's an area where um, the policy advisory committee determined, look, this is so far out, it's not likely to be threatened by urbanization. But the bottom line is we're going to have to do additional review and apply the factors that you have a copy of those factors for actually getting to the point where we make a recommendation. <clears throat> yes. Yes, they are. Some of those, I mean, they overlap, don't they? On some yes. Of those. yes. In, yeah. in many cases, you have urban reserves and rural reserves. And again, we'll have to sort that out. Which are we going to choose? A couple other important points, and then I'll, I'll quit. Um, first point, um, I want to reiterate the thing that Dan had pointed out, and that is there's a um, round of very important public uh, meetings coming up and these are open houses where the general public and everybody that wants to has an opportunity to come in and learn a little more and provide comments. Um, the first one actually is next week, uh, April 15th, um, just down the road here at the Development Services Building. So if you're interested in what's going on, um, that's a chance to come in and uh, walk around, see the maps. Uh, talk to people who know a little something about it and um, maybe have some additional information or provide uh, comments. A uh, couple other things. We're, we're at a, a juncture now. Um, Dan's explained to you that we know um, now or have a forecast for population and a forecast for um, generally for jobs. What we don't have is a translation of that to how much land do we need. If we recognize that we've, we're going to have candidate um, areas for urban reserves, the real question becomes for the region, well, yeah, but how much land do we really need on a 50-year horizon? And that's a complicated question. Um, and it, to oversimplify it greatly, it's a question of are we going to go up or are we going to go out? Um, Dan has presented you with a projection of when Oregon City fills up um, and you know it's not not all on a planning horizon not all that far uh, away the question is well is Oregon City interested in uh, doing more going further up on a 50-year horizon is what's a, what's a reasonable expe expectation um, if you're not then we're going to have to go out um, that same question is being asked in the region as a whole. Um, there's a lot of additional capacity for growth um, in the region, in Portland and in other locations uh, in Clackamas County, in unincorporated urban Clackamas County. Uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of potential for growth. In fact, um, the number is pretty staggering. The um, actual growth uh, over the last well, since the urban growth boundary was adopted, almost all of it has been accom accommodated in the urban growth boundary that was established initially. Uh, and I, I don't have the accurate number here in front of me, but it's something like 90% of the growth has been accommodated in existing cities. And there's a, still capacity left. So this question of how much land we need um, in order to uh, accommodate the expected population and employment growth over 50 years is very much dependent upon what we decide for uh, the existing urban area. How much are we going to put in the existing urban area? What, what do we want the urban form to look like? Are we all going to be downtown Portland? Are we going to be sisters? Are we going to be um, Hollywood or Selwood or, you know, what, what do we anticipate for the region? And that's a tough question to uh, answer. It's also important because we have to have some idea about what the expectations are uh, for the bang for the dollar for the areas that we bring in. What are we going to have those areas look like? Uh, are they going to look like um, sisters or 
uh, downtown Portland or Bellevue or Hollywood or, uh, you know, there are a lot of different options. So that's part of the puzzle that we're trying to sort out here. Um, so that's where we are right now. Um, there's a lot of work still to be done. Uh, our policy advisory committee meets later this month and they've been meeting monthly. Uh, and we'll begin to fine tune these designations and actually uh, hopefully get to the point where we have urban and rural reserves identified um, by the end of this year. So I'll stop there. I'm sure you have questions. Tim. Um, I have a question regarding uh, the infrastructure and grading the infrastructure. You gra you've graded water and sewer, but uh, how do you weigh in on transportation on all those sites? Because obviously that's a, a huge concern for us. That's a really good question. Um, let me start by saying that uh, we had similar sort of process where we um, asked a variety of service providers for transportation <coughs> facilities to do the same kind of analysis. What, you know, where would it be easiest to accommodate or provide new transportation facilities? Frankly, the first round of information that we got back, which is the information that um, that our policy advisory committee had at, when arriving at this recommendation was pretty bad. Um, it was bad because it was done um, just from the standpoint of, well, which is, what, what kinds of areas are easiest to build roads in? And of course, that means anything that's flat is easier to build on than it's steep. But what it didn't do, that analysis didn't include any sort of analysis or relationship to what kind of facilities were existing in the urban growth boundaries. So as an example, in Oregon City, of course, um, you're, you know, the area south of Oregon City, I like to think of as the world's biggest cul-de-sac. Um, you know, there's no way to get out of there. Um, but that's not something that was analyzed in the first go around. Um, ODOT has just today released an analysis of what they think they've ranked the state facilities in this area kind of using that high low medium um, analysis and obviously you know as, as all of you know because you're engaged in this planning game uh, there's nothing cheap as far as trying to fix the transportation system but they did do um, a relative rating uh, for state facilities. Not surprisingly, um, the two areas that they ranked as being the most difficult and expensive to fix are the areas uh, on I-5 between uh, 205 and the Marion County line. Um, that area is uh, a mess. And uh, as far as any potential expansion, that area is um, very difficult to serve. Among other things, if you go south of the Willamette River, you've got to build a new bridge. Um, that's you know, a huge impediment. The other area that they uh, pointed out that was um, very difficult and expensive to fix is um, the area from Stafford up to uh, the Clackamas on I-205, the Clackamas interchange on 205. It's a mess. It's expensive to fix. You got a bridge to repair. It's a you know. Um, so those are two very constrained uh, areas for trying to um, if you're trying to figure out where to locate uh, reserves. But the reality is, for transportation facilities, we know that um, we've got a difficult proposition. <laughs> Uh, particularly if you're looking at it just from the road standpoint. I mean, there's a lot of talk now about, look, we need to look at this whole issue a little bit differently and not focus just on providing um, new lane miles on the freeways. We also need to talk about how we're going to um, change or make the urban form uh, successful in reducing reliance on the automobile. So you got that whole topic going on, too, and that's the up or out question to some extent. Um, so that's a long answer to your question, okay. but answer that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not answered yet. That's the other part of it. So yeah. It's not really an answer. <laughs> so are you going to do the transportation overlay at your next PAC meeting? Is that going yes. On next? We'll, at least, um, we'll at least provide the information from ODOT because I think it's very informative. Um, the other thing that happens, I've referred, used this term iterative. Um, Metro has the capability of doing some modeling. They have this giant model that's called 
metroscope, and they're able to kind of feed information in that says, okay, if you do, if you assume this and put the density here, what kind of transportation facilities do you have to put where? And they can do it in, in the reverse too, to some extent. They can say, well, if we um, if we just build a light rail and a bus and facilitate walking and make dense communities, uh, where do people go? Um, where will they locate? So they've done some of that analysis and they'll do more of it and it'll inform the decisions that we make. Other questions? I think you glossed over Dan, but I think it's important to really look at those eight factors because that's the next analysis and I sure want, as we look at this, the large number of acres outside our community that are in the to be urbanized uh, candidate area, um, I think we need to be very clear about those factors. Anybody want to go through those? Because I think that's huge. well. And I don't mean to interrupt, but yeah. I, you know, the one thing that I did leave out is that you know we've been working with Dan and the other planning directors and the cities in general to try and talk about those kinds of issues because one of the questions that's very important in those factors it's you know other than the serviceability thing which is what we've really done with this first step is apply the serviceability factors the other thing is how do these reserve candidate reserve areas relate to the existing cities you know you may have a uh, downtown area in Oregon City that's a town center or a regional center that you have very um, you know, that as a city you are focused on encouraging development and the question becomes well so if we add land um, on the east side of Oregon City to the urban growth boundary 40 years from now how does that fit into what we're doing in downtown Oregon City and we've asked those questions and are hoping you'll be able to help inform that that answer I, I think there's a a couple of areas of related to those factors that we need to take a closer look at. Uh, transportation is definitely one. Dan, it's the back. Handout? Yes, it, the, on the frequently asked questions, it's the last page. Those are the, both urban or and rural reserve summary. factors. It's also there's also a summary on this. If you don't want to read the law, you can read the summary in, the, in something class, else we put together. <laughs> on one page. Okay, okay, got it. But um, when, when I think one area of consideration we. The planning department in Oregon City just started doing this in the last couple of days. Was um, taking a closer look at the slope maps in our Title Three areas, um, and I think there's more detail to be done in that area. I think there's more detail to be done in terms of transportation and, and connectivity. And one of the concerns we have with uh, Clackamas Heights area is, you know, it's just kind of bulging out to the east, and there's nothing to connect any sort of future road system to unless you uh, go to the north and put a bridge across the Clackamas River and it's and then you're getting into just really high cost and you know how do you how do you fund something like that and you can probably see the bridge from Seattle <laughs> <laughs> yeah right yeah. exactly um, and then another thing is uh, we, we, we started to take a look at the lotting pattern as some of these areas are developed uh, at you know, were developed in the county maybe in the 60s or in the 70s. They have one, two, three acre lots. It makes it really hard to serve that density efficiently, and it makes it unlikely that it's going to redevelop at higher density. So I think we, we need to take a closer look at, at those uh, lotting patterns. Um, those are the three big things that, that stick out in, in, my, in, in my mind. And the other problem with that Clackamas Heights area to the east is the topography varies so much. You have a lot of steep areas, you have a lot of ravines, and then you have these small areas of plateaus where it's relatively flat. And it's, it's sort of like the park place concept plan area and sort of magnified. So it makes it hard to get, mm -hmm. again, it's hard to get the connectivity. It's hard to get uh, urban densities that's contiguous to existing urban development. Um, it, it makes it really difficult. And, and in a sense, maybe not politically is attractive, but I think if you go south into the Beaver Creek Hamlet area, it's a little uh, easier in terms of connectivity and uh, potential development. But, but those are some, some areas we need to take a closer look at, I think. 
Uh, so the factors are going to be. Oh, I mean, that's how that's how these candidate areas are being evaluated. Is is, the, is looking at the factors. Um, I guess I can't even think out fifty years because, of course, I'll be at the great golf course in the sky. <laughs> but um, <laughs> the um, I also can't. I, I guess I have a hard time really taking that seriously, except for sort mm -hmm. of some projections. We need to take it very seriously, but. Um, there will be those who come after us that will be looking at it in 10 years and in 20 years and in 30 years with a fine tooth comb and have different ways of looking at it. But um, because this isn't locked into state law, it's locked in as a pol as a metro policy, isn't it? How, how well, it is. It is. is it actually it? is state law. It, it becomes state law. It goes to LCDC. And it will be reviewed. The decisions okay. will be reviewed by LCDC. Uh, ultimately, um, the counties and metro will be amending their comprehensive plan. So, just like anything else okay. we do from a land use, it becomes part, part of, of your plan. comprehensive plan. I mean, you raise a good issue. I'm certainly not arrogant enough to think that the decision we will make is right. Um, it'll be wrong. Uh, you know, we won't have the crystal ball isn't that good um, to think out 50 years. Things will change um, that we haven't anticipated. We can't. So um, I'm certain the decision will be revisited sometime before we get to the 50 year horizon. But when it's revisited, unless the state law has changed, it'll be revisited on a regional basis. We won't be in the position of sort of amending things piece by piece. It'll be more of a regional look at the entire area, and that's probably an important principle to keep in mind. So, uh, you know, my guess is that if we're successful and actually make this decision, it'll stand for a while. Um, it'll be, I don't know what a while means, but it's probably 10, 15, 20 years anyway um, before we get back to um, reviewing it in, in great detail. And the only other point I want to make before, and I always forget to do this till the, till the end, is when we talk about this, there's sort of an assumption that we're going to divide this 400,000 acres into urban or rural. The reality is that um, most of this land is likely to remain undesignated. It'll be just what it's always been. Um, we're only going to protect the most important farm and forest land and natural landscape features and those that are threatened by urbanization. They're areas that we want to protect and say not only are they very important, but they're in the way of potential urban development. And so that's, that's, that reduces the area that ultimately gets designated. And I've already talked about the need to figure out how much land we're going to um, add to the urban urban reserves. And that even in the area that Clackamas County has um, proposed, it's 36,000 acres. And that's a lot. That's uh, three Damascuses or Damasci, I don't know what you call them. But, um, you know, that's just in Clackamas County. You're looking at this on a regional basis, and you have all of Washington County and portions of Multnomah County that are also potentially eligible. So. Certainly, we're not going to end up dividing the 400,000 acres into one of those two designations. In fact, most of the area probably will um, be undesignated. Dan. Do they have a priority then? If, it, if something is designated as an urban reserve because of all these factors, does it have a priority then? Yes. When the urban growth boundary does grow, is that is that yes? What we're state saying? law. Oh, state law is very clear. State law says that if you are going to expand the urban growth boundary, the first place you look is urban reserves. You have to. So, and it's very difficult to get out of that box. Um, there's this exception that says if you have a really important significant special need that can't otherwise be satisfied, you can maybe get out of that requirement. But the reality is, um, you know, if, you're, if you have reserves planned for 40 to 50 years, it's hard to imagine that the first few urban growth boundary adjustments will be able to go anywhere except to areas that are designated as an urban reserve. And that's part of the reason for doing this process and doing it making one decision like that. It's, you know, it, it helps us not have to go through this conversation every five years about how to add 5,000 acres or 500 acres or, you know, at least you know the areas to look at. You can begin to plan those, you know, in a way that makes some sense. Um, 
So that's that's the reason for picking out urban reserves. It's a good question, though. Doug. Uh, if we just look at the Oregon City area, you and pull up, cut left of the microphone there. Yeah, excuse me. You look at, you look at the areas on the um, areas to be studied as potential urban reserves, and I understand this is nowhere near a final map. I think you'll you'll I think probably everybody at this table knows this area is in terms of the topography is would be challenging to deal with this area south of Oregon City. There are various areas up here in what's called the Clackamas Heights that would also be challenging for that uh, same reason. Um, uh, Dan Dreadlaw mentioned Beaver Creek. It, it actually isn't included in this finger. This goes down that, 213. That, that was my point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, what I was going to say was that, uh, that there's a couple of things. I think I think there are these other factors are probably going to reduce those areas a great deal. And the question is, in the process, then do we increase areas more than what we've got there? Uh, almost everything we talk about are issues of some kind of physical constraint, slopes, not only steep slopes, but in terms of serviceability of water and sewer and all those kinds of things. And um, I think the concept of a sense of place is also very important. There are a couple of Clackamas uh, cities that say, no, we don't want to expand next to us. And a couple of the cities that border the Stafford area are just simply not interested in moving into the Stafford area. And I think it has something to do with their sense of place, too. And so that's one thing I think we all need to be talking about. Not, not only everything that's potentially physically served, could be served by an urban community, but what, at what point does Oregon City cease being really what Oregon City is? And personally, I think it's already happened to some degree, and I think it's a concern I have. Uh, you know, and if I, I, I suppose there's nothing in this that doesn't say, well, you can define an urban reserve someplace, and if it goes that way, maybe you still create another city that already has a sense of place in its particular area. I realize how challenging Damascus is, but I think the residents of Damascus would prefer the situation that they're dealing with now than having Gresham come out, uh, come into them from one side and Happy Valley come in from the, to them from the other side because they've had a long-standing sense of place, as has Beaver Creek. And so um, I think these are things that we also ought to weigh in, in our comments and our However, thought process. I would just like to remind us that it's not quite that easy, I mean, uh, just to be the devil's advocate here, because if local aspira aspirations prevail, then Hillsborough will get to grow into the high, highest quality farmland in the state that are, that's outside their borders. And uh, that's their local aspiration. Yeah. So, And if, if not in, let's say, West Lynn, then the rest of us have to take the population. And so there's regional equity issues that are going right. to be very challenging. And the other part of the regional equity is, is also this jobs housing jobs, imbalance. Yes. And if you look at the map behind Doug, you can see the area in green. That The area Washington County wants to look at for urban reserves is over twice of everything that Multnomah and Clackamas County is even, even looking at. So I think that's an important point. If it doesn't go here, it's going to go somewhere else. So that, that whole regional question, you have to also look at, I think. Uh, and then I just wanted to talk about the politics, just briefly make sure you understand it, that one vote can derail this whole thing. That's right. There has to be consensus. So one vote. And the, uh, the politics, as I understand it, I mean, I think all action is local. So it starts, you know, here. We talk about our local aspirations. The county approves that or not. Uh, anyway, they, they come to a decision. And then it goes to the core four. Well, that's where um, Ben Clackamas County has to intersect with the desires of Multnomah County and Washington County. And, then and Metro. And Metro. So it requires those four votes. If they can't agree, then essentially we go back to the... We go back to the old the way. The way old way, where we move it every five years based on some other factors. Jim. I'd like to ask a question. Um, is there a corresponding process that's going on um, at the state level? Um, and what I mean by that is we're, Metro is doing these forecasts of 
population and economic growth and how all that will be distributed just in the metro area. But does DLCD, for example, do anything as far as overall population growth for the state and, you know, what growth should be channeled to, you know, Eugene as opposed to Portland or the little small towns like Toledo that need economic growth desperately as opposed to just having Portland burst at the seams? A big look. Yeah. I know there's a state in agency that does the population and employment projections on a regular basis. And the big look was an attempt to talk about, you know, that whole requirement for a 20-year supply based on population. Um, but I don't know if there's a state process as detailed as this when it comes to allocating, you know, where the growth is going to go. Do you know of anything? Yeah. Well, there is a – I mean, the state does do – uh, what you're describing. They do a population and employment forecast. Um, they do it for the entire state. So they say, you know, here's what we're anticipating in the Portland metropolitan region. Um, and so all of the jurisdictions, when they do this kind of a process, although ours is unique in the state, um, they use that forecast that's done by the state. Um, the you know, the people at Metro are far more sophisticated than uh, the state as far as taking those numbers, massaging them, and making sense out of them, and, and getting to this question, most importantly, of how much is can we expect to allocate inside the existing boundary, and how much can we expect to have to accommodate outside the boundary. That part of the decision is really left up to um, the local governments. So. The state gives you a number. Um, you can you can uh, use that number or um, change it if you have a good reason and way to explain why you're changing it. Um, and that's that's the process that occurs statewide. Essentially, the metro region came up with the urban rural reserves process. Yes, we did. So it was developed yes. by the metro region yes. as an alternative to the to doing five this years. every five years. Yeah, that's right. Other questions about that? Yes, Carter. Um, I'm curious as to whether or not urban agriculture has been uh, considered in this process at all. The idea that uh, we can grow our produce locally and you know minimize transportation costs, know where our food comes from. Yeah, it's a, a topic that's been discussed a lot. Um, the question, uh, you know, and it, and it depends, I guess, on whom you speak with. If you talk to the to um, the experts at the Oregon Department of Agriculture, their view is, well, um, it's important to recognize that um, and and it's a growing into part of the agricultural economy. Um, the, the, the part of the economy that supports it and keeps it going is much larger farms in the traded sector agricultural economy. Um, that being said, uh, I don't think that there's an expectation necessarily that <clears throat> we're going to be adding areas to the urban growth boundary with the anticipation that um, we'll be preserving them as farms. Um, it's more a conversation about, well, what do you have right next to the urban growth boundary um, that's appropriate? Now, well, there, there's an exception. I think that's the point. I think the idea would be that you do have an agricultural area inside of a population center. Right. And there's in the city as an of island kind of. Yeah, and the city of Damascus is dealing with this um, and and they have um, some proposals that they're trying to sort out that would do some of that. So I guess it's uh, the best answer I can give you is it's a topic that's being talked about a lot but there's not I don't think there's a consensus about what to do about it. The city of Damascus, um, who's had a lot of trouble, as you know, um, getting their comprehensive plan put together and getting things adopted, has talked about exactly what you're describing, which would be to figure out a way to um, allow that urban agriculture to occur inside the city. So they're, they're working on it. The trade-off, of course, is if you allow or, or somehow preserve that flat, Hundred acres of farmland in the city of in the city of Damascus means that's usually the best area for employment and high density development. You got to find another place to put that. So you have that trade off all the time that's so difficult to deal with. Yeah, ask what I think is the most important question: How are we going to get at our local aspirations? 
um, it's my view, I would like us around the table to be as knowledgeable and as vocal about what our local aspirations are, as West Lynn, for instance, is, who we will hear tomorrow morning, I'm sure, <laughs> at the reserves. Um, so you're becoming the angel's advocate now? <laughs> the angels? Well, she was the devil's advocate before. Oh. <coughs> um, so anyway, that's the question. How are we going to get, I mean, right now, uh, the only local aspirations that we have on record is it exist in our comprehensive plan and the concept plans that we have produced, but it doesn't address these I areas that are outside our urban growth boundary. And so I'm getting very nervous about the process that we're going to use to do that. And I, I know I've suggested multiple times about uh, conversations with our citizens, and that doesn't seem to be the way that you guys would like to do it, but um, we need to have a process or a mechanism to to get there. Well, I lay that before you. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, guess, I, mean, the, I guess the question is in terms of the recommendations coming together, uh, at what time does this pretty does this substantially get sewn together? Well, um, you know, there's a public involvement component that's going to go on for yep. the next three weeks. Um, that's a big deal. We'll be sorting through what we learn from that. There's a lot of s behind the scenes staff work being done to um, refine the suitability analysis, if you will, to look at do what you're talking about, Doug, because. The, the lines you see on the map are gross in nature. Um, you know, and south of Oregon City, for example, I know that there are parcels immediately adjacent to the boundary south of Oregon City that probably are at this are topographically the same as what you have in mm -hmm. the city. And that, there are some areas there that, when you get out, get the fine pencil out, make some sense to include. Um, but there are some also some logical areas where that doesn't happen. We have to have this, you know, put together. Um, at I think to the at the point where the Board of County Commissioners has a a picture of what they want to recommend for Clackamas County by um, the end of the summer. Um, that's that's really what we're talking about. So you know there's a there's a short timeline. Um, there's been some noise recently, some talk about man maybe we ought to extend that for a couple months or something and work beyond the end of the year, we're really feeling pressured. Um, and there may be, may be some good rationale for doing that, but there's only a short time period before um, Metro has to start making the real decision about whether or not they're going to expand the boundary and where. So there's that, there may be a little bit of flex there, but not a lot. So the date I talk about is the end of the summer for getting the um, getting some sort of a real recommendation um, out. And a lot of this is, you know, again, is fine tuning. But the part that we really need your help with, frankly, is that um, not not just the technical part of it. We need help there too. But it's also this. You know, here's our plan for the city of Oregon City. And looking out 50 years, if we were to, um, do we want to expand at all in, fi in the next 50 years? And if we do, kind of where and, and what sense. do we want? How does it relate to our existing city? Because that's the part, I don't know the answer mm -hmm. to that question. We're relying on the cities to give us that, that information. Carter. Um, just to clarify the <coughs> process and the schedule, at the end of 2009, um, Metro would like to have intergovernmental agreements with each of the counties. And actually, the intergovernmental agreements would be uh, the end of end of 2009, or at least the early winter of 2009. And you're saying then at the end of this summer, uh, Clackamas County um, Board of Commissioners would like to have their consensus yeah. Arrived at. Yeah. And so there's. And so, and so, in order for the county to come to its consensus, it needs some input from the cities. As and soon as possible. <laughs> so you, so yeah. you say you want, and, and what form does that input come to you? 
Well, it can come in any form you want to give it to us. I mean, I, it, it, it can be technical, yeah. It can be technical information. It can be um, conversations with the Board of County Commissioners. It can be presentation at a work session in front of the board. It can be a written submittal with a technical analysis and an aspiration. Like, so you need that like, by, by September. Like what right. you've got yes, here I in the letter from um, the city to okay. Chris Steffenbach. And yeah, the, I mean the sooner we can get it the better because part of what our policy advisory committee is going to be doing is looking at that information when they <coughs> do make recommendations to the board. So this process is, I've, when people have asked me about the process, I've often described it as messy because um, it's not, if you're a lineal thinker, this process def defies description. Um, it's, it's just not very lineal in nature. I mean, there's uh, a lot of things going on at the same time. I mean, I haven't even tried to put this in context with a lot of the activity that Metro's doing that affects cities in particular directly. I mean, they're updating their regional transportation plan. They're um, deciding where to extend light rail. They're talking about a number of issues that are extraordinarily significant um, for how we do business in the existing urban growth boundary and within the city of Oregon City and within unincorporated urban Clackamas County. And that's part of this process. So so I, I sit on a, the regional reserves committee and we meet tomorrow morning for four hours and uh, you know once again I'll when they ask if Oregon City has its aspirations, and we're one of the, well, not few, there's a, still a handful of cities that haven't done that yet, but I don't have a way to represent you out in those areas because we haven't really talked about it. So, um, Tim. Well, first I, I'd like to say, uh, you know, that we're fortunate to live in a state where we can even have this discussion because I've been in, I've lived in other states where uh, it doesn't matter. It's going to grow, and you'll just go along with it. So I'm pleased to be able to participate in this kind of discussion, and, and hopefully we will be able to manage it. And thank you for to Metro for even putting it together. Second of all, I think the biggest issue we face is, is education, as we always have and always will. Um, generally, you know, we sit in a meeting like this and discuss all the things that are technical and that need to be done, and we do it, and it and it happens, or it, it gets to the the voter and. And all of a sudden, everybody says, gee, well, there's a few naysayers out there, and this isn't going to work, and here's the three reasons why. The problem is the voters don't get to see the balance discussion. And I think that's what we, as a, as a planning commission and a city commission and a city, after all, need to take to the voters. We need to have a balanced discussion, and it has, I think we have to do it through town meetings or some, some fashion. We've got to get to the community, and we've got to give them a balanced look at and, and explain to them why this is happening. Why do we need to do this? You know, maybe maybe we don't, but if if they don't have all the reasons, they're not. We're not going to make good decisions, and uh, we've seen too many bad decisions made through over the last few years that we're suffering through today, and I don't think we want to do that again. So this, to me, is a huge decision. And you know what, Alice said it perfectly. Who's going to care in 50 years? Who's going to even know? But the fact of the matter is, if we don't plan 20, 50 years out, we're hurting our, ourselves and our children. So. You know, we need to look at this pretty carefully, but I, 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 I absolutely agree that we, we need to get to the community and we need to educate the community a lot more than we have in the past, and I don't know how to do it. I mean, I've tried. You know, we've done it through a lot of different ways, but, but I think that's going to be critical as we go forward, and I know we're running short on time for these things, but, but I think it's critical. Um, I think Tim has just given a segue to what I wanted to raise, um, and it's also in response to what you were saying. Um, you mentioned that West Lynn is very vocal um, about its aspirations on this committee. For Stafford. Well, um, we're right next to West Lynn, and if they have a process whereby they have determined what their aspirations are and they're our neighbor, maybe we could have a little neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor summit with them and, and learn from them how, what, th what their processes yeah. are. They, 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 they actually, I don't think they had much of a process. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> they had a vocal, yeah. they had a vocal yeah, this, mayor. Yeah. Yeah. And the vocal one. mayor, but no process. Yeah, I, I'd, no I'd like process. to su suggest uh, the well, the same thing that I've suggested before. But we had a, a chamber of commerce day uh, for the leadership class on growth, and um, we used a kind of a metro formula of, of, of a series of questions that we asked the class at the beginning of 20, 20 students, and we kind of used them for a little test case. We asked them questions. You know, do you want to grow up or out? Uh, what do you, uh, should where should growth go? 
corridors and centers or at the edge or m multiple things? What about transportation choices? And, um, and then we gave them kind of growth 101, all of the issues of the day, starting with the region and the county and local, and then we ended up with a panel on annexation. And then we gave them a test at the end of the day. And it was very interesting. Education does make a huge difference because whereas some of the questions were left blank and some of them um, really had moved off of neutrals into areas where they, so it was, it was really semi-dramatic. Um, and anyway, the, the, the way that I, I would like to see us talk to our community, because I think we have another reason to do it too because of those annexations which uh, create um, uh, those, the, the two failed annexations that create, create that created um, you know, some challenges for us in the future developing our urban into our urban growth boundary. But um, I would like to see like uh, maybe two two meetings, probably a, fo a focus group we, we could do. And then another one would be a town hall meeting like uh, Metro likes to do, where you have stations that show these things. And at each station, there's a series of questions that, that get recorded. And uh, because I think the education needs to be done in a very targeted way. And, um, our staff and uh, with the assistance of Metro 2 can provide the maps and um, we've done that with many of our open houses like for the McLaughlin uh, project and others. I mean it's staff intensive certainly but I'm not positive how except you know I mean we can we can do the factors overlay but I don't think I as one of five really want to be responsible for making that decision. I mean I have my own views and I'd like to provide my input into the process but um, and, and we'd have to do it very, you know, very quickly. But, um, you know, when we did the focus groups of four, we hired a company that, you know, knew how to do the random sample and ask the appropriate questions. But I think just to do a community open house that would have dual purposes, the education factor as well as um, making sure that we get input from citizens as they're learning about, about these, these processes. Where do you want to grow? If not up, then out. If, if or not out, then up. Um, you know, what, do we, what do we do with 20,000 people? I mean, maybe they could have a chance to, you know, move the boundary or, or whatever. But that's, I mean, at, 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 mo at, at minimum, I think those, those are the two things that I would really like to see. I mean, there's a cost factor, of course, both for, for money and for staff to do that. But I'm not positive how we'll get our arms around it except for us around the table voting. And to me, that's a little limiting. I don't know. More feedback? We all of them ask what's going to happen. Well, yes, but I would like to have more input. Than yeah, I, I, I would suggest that we, we do that and then we actually have a study session, another joint study session among us in no, no more than a month to see how we put that together. Or, well, probably it would be more efficient to have it put together and then come back together to well, review right, the. Right, right. Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. I mean, you, you dra there's a draft as to how we might proceed, then we discuss a it. A process. Yes. Is that doable, Mr. Patterson? <laughs> I mean, that's a very short period of time with a bunch of other things on our agenda, but if we're going to have anything by the end of the summer, well, I think that's probably part of the recommendation that needs to come to us. I mean, if, I mean I, I, I'm sure that Metro will put it in any time we get it, but if the county is going to wait for us, you know, other people will make our, may be making our decisions for us if we don't get on it. I mean, I don't know what staff has to say to that, but I mean, what would you say? You're our planning director. Um, you're getting all the pressure too, as am I sitting at the meeting, so. I think the discussion has to be made, but it, I mean, it's up to you on how much of the public you want to bring into it. It's, it's a complicated topic. And I think if you it win, is. It, it, it has to be, a, there's a lot of education involved, so I think that's going to determine how many people you bring in the process. It's, it's very complicated. You know, I, there's, there really is a concerted effort to have this issue discussed. We have a series of eight open houses in the next two weeks where it would be nice if we had Oregon City residents coming to those, um, to those open houses so they understand this. Um, there have been, you know, there are websites in both Clackamas County and um, and at Metro that discuss a lot of these topics. But, you know, to be honest about it, 
we've had a heck of a time um, getting the public involved. I yeah. mean, it's just it's just very hard to do, and it's a topic I go around and make speeches about at various places. That, that, you know, how do you how do you involve the public in a way not only that's you know in this day and age that's um, meaningful, reason, meaningful. Yeah, meaningful is a good term. Meaningful and and reasonably cost effective. I mean, yeah. you can't. I feel like you, we waste a, a lot of money trying to involve the public, and, and the results don't demonstrate that we've done that good a job at it. Or it somehow isn't raised to the point where you avoid the problem that you're talking about. You get done with all of this, and people are going, wait a minute, I never heard about this. Yeah, Larry. I don't know how. Mr. Blaine, at those open houses, would there be a place for an Oregon City component that could happen in the they will be there. Yeah. These maps will be on the wall, and if Oregon City wants to have a spot, we'd be more than happy to have you there. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah, it's too, city, too it's, close. Well, we can do uh, we could do a concerted effort to try to get the word out because that's at minimum that's that's a place to start. It's, hard. it's, a, it's our city council night, so we won't be there, but um, we could certainly market that. I don't know whether that's all we want to do, but. Sure. Yeah, I think that would be great. Daphne. Well, my question is: is um, so if we have a, a, a communication process for Oregon City residents, what what is the relationship between the Holcomb CPO and Beaver Creek and some of the adjacent groups that are come up in our boundaries? So, where do they fit in? Do they go to the general <coughs> discussion? Yes. They, they go to that. They go to the, they go to those open houses too. And you believe me, they'll be at all of them. They'll be there. Yeah. <laughs> well, they, they also have representation on the this Clackamas yes. County committee. On the committee, yeah. they do. All right. Yes, the Hamlets and Village and CPOs. Yes. The other question I was hoping to turn the on. We can spend a lot of time and effort talking about how we grow, uh, and particularly in expanding boundaries. But just what we faced with Beaver Creek, if we don't address issues of annexation, if our land use process in terms of approvals for development is as lengthy as it is today, you're still going to face some interesting issues in meeting any of these types of population projections. I mean, right. you can't tie up a process the way we've got it and expect we can meet what's coming at us. So that should be part of that discussion as well. Mm -hmm. Certainly part of the factors. So I don't know if we... Where are we going next? Yeah, I've only heard a couple of people talk about process, so well, I haven't heard enough to... Uh, I, under I, the... Could, if I could just ask for a sec here. Uh, is there anyone that disagrees with looking at a staff process to communicate with our citizens more fully on expansion? Disagreement? Okay. If you would like, mm -hmm. then you're going to love this one. Uh, <laughs> we can uh, have some recommendations at your commission meeting next week about how we might tie into this process. I think that would be great because the time is of the essence. Jim. Yeah. Is there, yeah. The lights on. Yeah. yeah. Are there? Uh, is there one a metro model for this kind of citizen participation? The and two, I mean, aside from West Lynn, are there other communities in the metro area that we can learn from in this, you know, type of citizen participation process? I, I think metro. I think they thought the process was going to be easier than anticipated on this whole local aspiration question because the timeline timeline was t too short to get into any sort of meaningful citizen involvement. I, there's a lot of cities that did what we did. In other words, Use you know, here's plans. here's the facts as we know it today. Here's what's in our, our adopted plans, and that's what we know. Yeah. The the when we asked this question at, at MPAC, Metro Policy Advisory Committee, the answer came back. Um, sort of like cities that are doing the usual things. Hillsborough has an annual, semi-annual visioning. So they did a community visioning that helped them to understand that they wanted to expand, have more jobs. Um, so others were updating their comp plan. So they were talking to, to the citizens because of that. So, I mean, we're just not in, we're between natural processes. And so yeah. we're kind of stuck in a way. So. Yes. Chris. Is there an opportunity to use uh, a website and some electronic input in the short timeline that we've got? I mean, I think that's a wise possibility. So, I mean, we can do that pretty. Easy. The the difficulty that you run into all that, and I, we can do that, and I think it's a good idea. But 
this stuff is well, it's it's really it, it's bedtime reading actually, uh, and <laughs> you're, well, and that's one of the problems. It's so in depth, it's so voluminous that your average citizen is not going to read through all that. Which is why I think that the um, you have to make it easy. Yeah, the, the the stations kind of concept that again Metro uses, we've used so successfully, could work. Uh, so anyway, we'll look forward to the staff report. Yeah, the, we probably don't need to spend the other thought that may be a better tool. Uh, and again, when you look at the television, Willamette Falls TV, or our web streaming, if someone could pre present some of this in little condensed snippets that people could tune into and ha and have a discussion, because that's the type of society we've become. Feed it to us in sound bites and uh, in something we don't have to read lots of information and we can get in and get out quick. So, you know, that would be a tool. Now, there's there's a real art to doing that that usually comes at a pretty good cost. So, but it's all. Okay. Well, we'll look forward to your report. Mm -hmm. um, Betty Mom just uh, flashed me a sign that said CIC, <laughs> CIC. <laughs> And I think that is an opportunity for a discussion at the Citizens Involvement Committee. So um, um, that would be you think. a good thing. To <laughs> <laughs> Very timely. Okay, um, ready for a break, and then we need to come back and talk about codes. I'm sure that'll be about five minutes. So uh, let's take about a. Can we do a five-minute break? We are. Okay. We are adjourned. Uh, we are in recess. Well, I'd like to talk about. We are now back in session. Um, this section is on the proposed code amendments. I know we can talk about this forever. Could we set a time limit of uh, half an hour? Okay, or less. <laughs> that means you must be succinct in your questions and uh, succinct in your responses. Okay, it'll be a challenge. All right. Uh, Pete and Christina. Thank you. Please lead us through it. Thank Madam you. Mayor and Commissioners, first, plural. Uh, last Mar so March, we had a work session with the City Commission to go over just a preliminary PowerPoint just to give a general outlay of the code amendment process, uh, the content of the code, and to get the uh, commission kind of just generally up to speed. And there were some outstanding issues that the Planning Commission had when they recommended approval of the code amendments in December and uh, requested a work session with the City Commission. So we are uh, one of the main reasons why we're here tonight is to look over those outstanding issues. In general, with this process, uh, planning staff does have some uh, other direction questions for you. And if you look at the memo, uh, dated April 2nd, with our new city logo, which I was very excited to see. <laughs> uh, you'll see there are three sections, A, B, and C. A is our preliminary selection of city commission hearing dates. And uh, by this evening, we would really appreciate it if we could get uh, just a general uh, direction if, if you find these dates acceptable, knowing, of course, that the public hearing process is subject to change. Two, uh, we have the opportunity for one more work session before the first public hearing if you do indeed want to move forward with those dates. Identify what code issues uh, need further discussion and also the confirmation that you want another work session. And on the second page, see outstanding code issues. Of these uh, planning commission issues, uh, we would like some further direction uh, for each one, either A, you would like to address these issues in the current amendment process, two, you'd like to address these issues in a separate amendment process, or C, you would not like to address these issues at this time. Uh, and I have uh, Tim Powell, the chair of the Planning Commission, who will lead that discussion. Uh, at the last City Commission work session, there were two other discussion items, and you'll see that at the last two items of the page before the attachment. One is the natural resource annexation policy, and Pete, in your email uh, that you received, had two, uh, rec two examples, one from Wilsonville and another from Lake Oswego, looking at their annexation policy. Uh, this does not have to be done during this code amendment process, but we wanted to give you as an option to look at. 
and attachment D, uh, uh, conservation easements. Uh, Commissioner Neely did bring up kind of a voluntary easement program uh, to look at preservation of open space, especially in regards to uh, habitat and Title III. And we uh, have information on that easement process that uh, Pete Walter can speak to. Right, and that was for existing property owners. Correct. For not for new development. No, that's not for new development. And uh, that is, again, something that does not have to be uh, pursued during this amendment process. It's a separate city policy. It does not need to be approved by ordinance because it's already been approved at the state level for us to have the, that option. Uh, but we did want to include those two. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Tim Powell, the chair of our planning commission. Thank you, Christina. Well, first I'd like to thank you all for coming so we could have this discussion. Actually, we'd like to thank you for coming. Well, <laughs> and I'm, I'm glad I'm here. Uh, second, I'd like to, to thank staff for an exceptional job. This has taken uh, an immense amount of time, and they've uh, everyone involved has done an, a, really an exemplary job. And thirdly, I'd like to thank the planning commission members. Uh, never have I served with four exceptional people as, as these guys. Um, really excellent questions. Uh, uh, I, it amazes me the, uh, the stuff that comes out of these guys, but um, it's been, it's, which is why we're here, quite frankly, because there's there's five or six items on here that we we discussed um, repeatedly throughout the process and weren't able to come up with an answer. Uh, we have our own opinions, I know, and wanted to f uh, bring these forward for discussion with the with the uh, the joint commissions. Um, <clears throat> I guess do we want to decide whether we want to address these issues first you know um, I think I think they're all important issues and I think they're critical to to the growth and the planning in the city so so I believe they're important and I believe we should probably move these forward and discuss them um, that's my com comment May I just ask if anyone disagrees so then let's move forward so the items that we'll go quickly over them and then we can go back and discuss each one individually but the uh, tree preservation uh, policy um, we this the question is should we adopt a comprehensive tree protection policy uh, and the where it got down to the critical issue was whether we the city can regulate all trees on owners properties and that's where we wanted to have some discussion with the city commission um, the planning commission felt it was uh, we have some some trees that are that are very important to the city and historic properties and historic trees but we also understand that the citizens have a right to their own property and so we we could not come up with an answer as to how we best regulated that so that's one of the discussion items we need to go through uh, commercial rezoning in the south end area um, in good planning, it makes sense to have some uh, uh, commercial area so people don't have to drive. And this is one area that we felt really needed to look at seriously about planning some commercial uh, areas in that south end area. Uh, the area grew without any plan like that, and um, we've brought this forward once and uh, decided to not pursue it. Now we're back. And I think that needs to be discussed. Nice question. Are you sure. looking at that in terms of, of looking at rezoning up there or looking as part of the comp plan that will develop on, on the south end side? Well, I think we're looking at it as a, as a rezoning yeah. initially because without that we won't have it. And then uh, planning, and the, depending on what happens in the uh, urban growth boundary, it'll be in the comp plan and a decision we'll have to make in addition to the comp plan. Yeah, I'm talking about the current urban growth boundary. Current uh, rezoning. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, third was temporary access structures, and the question was, uh, should we allow temporary, and I'm, we're talking about the kind of pop-up type uh, structures, uh, first in front of the homes, second next to homes, and um, if so, uh, sizes and, um, uh, what, what, let's see, sizes and placement. materials and placement. Um, we currently are, do not allow these to be in front of homes, although we have that uh, some out there, um, but th that's a code uh, compliance issue that we'll have to work on. Um, the other part of that is how do we enforce it and do we have the ability to enforce it. So that's the item we want to discuss, uh, not even specifically in the historic district, although that's where it first came up. Um, now it's kind of spread all over the city. Um, and then the big one is the sign code. 
we have been, I've been battling this since uh, I start, was on the city commission many, many moons ago. And I think that there's, uh, we tried at one time to change the sign code and were inundated with, um, with, with people didn't want to change it, felt it was a, a problem, and we didn't give enough notice and that type of thing. And I think that there's, um, there's many reasons that we want to do that. I mean, it's, uh, there's, there's a lot of um, new development, and in that new development, we want to be able to manage the signs that go in, and we can't do that today. We don't have the capability to manage it. No, it's, 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 very, it's very difficult. It all goes down to, uh, how do you always say that? To, when, when it gets down to enforcing something like that, I don't remember. You guys usually have a term for that, but oh, it uh, becomes a civil issue. Yeah, I, just, I, I don't remember. We've had that discussion so many times. Well, I forgot. Well, let, let me get a handle on that. Yes. Um, so we have nothing in our code right now that regulates new signs and new developments. We, we, we sorry, we ahead. do. It just is is in certain sections of the sign code the. Uh, options are quite broad and, and can general. have pretty big signs. Okay. And I guess that looking at uh, tying in the signs closer to the uh, land use process and looking at material, what the sign looks like, where it's placed, rather than just coming back <coughs> later through an over-the-counter permit and you meet kind of very, very general uh, requirements. I'm really interested in, in a weekend sign code. Everyone knows when we're not enforcing and mm -hmm. the weekends are just awful with temporary signs and lawn signs placed up and down our streets and it's uh well there's many examples yeah, of that i yeah. mean you know as you yeah, go no, through that's it, just enforcement that's uh, just exactly. my pet peeve um so sign code is is a huge discussion that we need to go through um natural resource annexation policy which came up after our discussion so you guys got a notice of notification of how we can manage that and then conservation easement which the uh commissioner neely was talking about so Shall we go to the beginning and start with tree preservation? That's it. So the question is, do we or can we um, allow or, I, or can we enforce um, allowing, uh, how do I want to say this, can we regulate, I guess, um, citizens who have a tree in their yard that is a historic tree, if you will, or a, what do we call them, a uh, heritage legacy tree. heritage tree, can we um, come up with a way to regulate their, uh, their ability to remove that tree, to change the structure of that tree, to damage that tree in any way? In the public, pro on the public right away, we can do that. We have, we have a process in place to do that, but we don't have that in, in, on, a, on a public, or on a uh, private property. So the question is, A, do we want to, and B, if we do, how do we do it? Because we do not have an inventory of heritage trees, first of all, correct? Mm -hmm. Correct. And the plan was, if I remember correctly, many years ago, we had a Natural Resources Committee that one of their charters was to go out and do that. And that has fallen by the wayside. So that's another question is, do we want to invest money to go out and find out about these legacy trees? And if so, is there any value in it if we're not going to be able to to have any plan to manage it? Daphne? Well, I guess my question is, is on City com uh, Council, we, um, a year or two ago, we vowed not to add any new programs with our um, fire annexation, and I'm not sure, would this be considered um, a new program? It would take new staffing to monitor it if we had a... Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think we discussed that when we did goal setting that this it would be a new program, and and Tim identified one of the one of the issues with the uh, with the um, original inventory is that the Natural Resources Committee developed guidelines, but they there was no staff to do the inventory. Doug and then one Chris. One mechanism. I mean, doing an in the inventory would be difficult. It also you have to specify what what a heritage. The next part of it would be in terms of perhaps its historic placement in terms of the history of the city, part of it, the age, and, and, and the species. Uh, you, you might adopt a rather simpler process. Uh, it, it wouldn't deal with all heritage trees, but there are probably a lot of residents that would like the trees that they currently have preserved. And whether they could actually recommend their tree to be a, her a heritage tree, and then 
anybody that subsequently buys the property, part of the, whether it's in the title agreement or whatever it is, it is actually a tree then that is protected. And it is actually the individual property owner at the time that's made that designation. And it seems to me it uh, probably would create less tension in the process. I have a hard time telling a person that they can't cut down their tree. If they want more sunlight for growing some of their flowers, they can't grow in the shade or whatever the reason might be, but that might be a mechanism that could be employed. So, and I guess I wasn't thinking of necessarily an entire program to do something I could see. Ideally, it would be we would go out and inventory the trees, but even if we had some level of protection where it was just a code enforcement issue where codes were implemented at when and if you wanted to remove a tree, you had to go meet certain criteria and standards and, and uh, go through a permitting process that wouldn't entail a whole new program to be implemented, maybe just pieces to a program added to. Um, that and that was something more realistic or doable than necessarily probably what they had envisioned prior, but one thought anyway. Yeah. Um, I don't have an answer to this, but I'm wondering if um, something would be more feasible, for example, if um, we had a like a nuisance tree list or a non-native species tree list, which would permit people to cut down non-native or nuisance species. Um, without a permit, but for another class of trees, heritage trees, trees of a certain diameter, certain trees of a certain age, historical importance, whatever, that that would require a permit. I mean, it seems, it seems, I mean, to cut down a locust tree, um, um, that's a non-native species. Um, you know, is is that something that we should worry about? Um, Whereas, you know, a nice white oak, I think we should worry about. Well, and that, that's exactly the question, is, is how do we manage that? And that's, that's what we, we need to define. And the city has defined what, you know, what trees should be street trees, but they haven't decided what should, trees should be legacy trees or historic trees. And, I, and, you know, we have a lot of people, and I'm fortunate that I live in a, a, the McLaughlin neighborhood, a very historic neighborhood, and we have tree calls regularly. From people who, I mean, even street trees, or, or in people's yards, who say this tree is 150 years old, and there's somebody out there with a hacksaw, you know, trying to cut this thing down because they can't grow flowers. Well, I, there's not much we can do about it right now. Do we want to? Do we want to pursue that? And I, I, I don't know. And it, you know, staff was concerned, and rightly so, that we'd have legal uh, issues, and and we agreed as a group that we should bring this forward so we could have this discussion. I think. You were pretty vocal about it as well, Dan. In fact, I'd like to expand this. Um, I think it's more than heritage trees or whatever we want to call them. I think it's all trees. Anything over six inches uh, needs to have a permit. Uh, the city of Lake Oswego has adopted something like this. So if you have a property, you want to cut down a tree, you're allowed to have one tree a year cut down. You have to get a permit. Why? W why, why do I feel that way? It's because part of the character of this area is about trees. It is about the 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 topography and if we just let it if we let people uh, property owners have that ability just to do whatever they want they they don't have that ability to do whatever they want on a number of issues they can't put a dump on their property they can't put a let's say a residential property you can't put a a, a commercial strut there's, there's all kinds of regulations about what you can and can't do on your property can't raise roosters Pardon me? You can't raise roosters in the city. Yeah, I mean, there's, 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 it's a multitude of things. It's, it's not that, um, and, and when it comes to the trees, I just think it's an important part of our, our area here that it's more than even just heritage trees in my mind. I think it's really important. I think 50 years from now, if we just let this run the way that it's running right now, what differentiates us as a place? We talked about placemaking. This this will be any old place. Mostly, feels like Southern California at some point. So I'm I'm pretty passionate about it because I, I it's one of the reasons I moved here. And a lot of people have moved here is because of this area and what it looks like, what it feels like. So. Well, I guess I I I, I kind of gave the statement of what my feelings were about it, but. 
Um, the older properties, I think, that have older trees, I think the residents generally tend to like them and would like to keep them. I think where you see the bareness of trees is where you've seen developments go in and they've been stripped. And it's true that we've done some things about them, but they're, they're all things that are outside the build, building envelope, frankly. Um, we uh, haven't dealt with the issues of mitigation of trees that are cut within the building uh, envelope. I don't know if the new ordinance deals with that. I hope it does. But, um, uh, it you know, it always amazes me, and it's almost anywhere you look around in this area, you look towards West Lynn, and boy, it looks like a forested area, but if you get on the West Lynn side and look back at Oregon City, it also looks like a forested area because there are a lot of dominant Doug firs and so forth that are up there and that are standing, and a lot of them are residential properties, um, which is why I suggest it would be good for the resident themselves to identify the tree and then keep it in the per perpetuity of its life that would remain there until you know it got damaged in some way. I, I have mixed feelings about this. Um, only I, I'd love, in an ideal world, I'd love to put something like this in, into place. Um, but in this world, where we have to both enforce it and uh, regulate it and, and um, with limited staff resources, uh, that concerns me. However, I would be willing to shop it, like to the CIC, if um, it'd, be it'd be nice to hear. Yeah. First of all, I, I know when the Natural Resources Committee talked about it, you know, they were anticipating pretty contentious hearings, and I think that every city that's put these in, the hearings are pretty contentious because it's personal property rights versus, you know, an overriding, um, uh, you know, view of, of what the city should be. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I'd I'd love to do that, but I I'm not sure that now that now is the time. I I agree with you, with you. I, I'm not positive how much of our canopy that we're losing annually. So I'm not sure we know what the problem is. I also am probably more interested in mitigation of a cut tree um, as well, or I am am interested in. In that, you know, if you cut a tree, then what are you going to put in its place? This probably concerns me more. Uh, Carter. Yeah, I, I know of a situation um, where a property had recently been annexed into the city with the um, with the idea of putting in a housing development, and um, and and that property was logged, um, and then the property th there was a yep. after think, annexation. <laughs> yeah. And, and and subsequently, there was a a, a, a plan put forward to uh, to put in a housing development, and that was after the trees were gone. Um, and I b believe that the uh, code that we're looking at would prohibit something like that from happening. And if if, if we're talking about you know hundreds of acres of, of an annexed land, and we have this hole in our existing code, um, that's something I'd really like to close up. Um, we do have that issue of, of property rights, and Lake Oswego has that problem as well. And I think a simple, um, uh, a, a simple uh, approach to that would be to have our city attorney talk to Lake Oswego city attorney and find out what um, what the what the defense is or what the what the mm -hmm. tactics are that the attorneys use to support Lake Oswego's tree policies. Um, the question I have is how uh, how long uh, of a moratorium did we have? Um, on adding new programs to the city because I understand if we do this uh, tree ordinance right, we want to have one or two arborists on city staff, um, I yeah. think, in addition to what we have currently uh, for park staff. Four more years. Staff. Four more years. It's a five-year. It so five year. It, it, I'm kind of um, understanding that, you know, to maybe take a full bite of this pie might be too much right now. But maybe it makes sense to try to close some of the loopholes and then to also begin to shop these ideas to the CIC and to have a community discussion and community de uh, debate about where we want to go as a city uh, in, in terms of protecting some of these uh, resources. Um, I agree with, uh, with uh, uh, Doug Neely um, uh, about uh, having um, property owners um, nominate their trees uh, to, to 
for uh, heritage tree status. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, maybe it's not entirely mandatory. Maybe it's mandatory depending on the size of a property or or a pre-development uh, situation. But uh, I think we it, maybe it makes sense to try to pick this thing off a little bit at a time. Okay, we're moving on to our half an hour yeah, here. So <laughs> go ahead, Daphne. Well, um, first of all, I moved into my neighborhood for the trees too. But at this point, I'm not su a supportive of um, doing a full-fledged um, tree ordinance at this time because of the reasons I had just said. However, that being said, I would be um, interested if staff or if somebody could come up with some kind of incentive or credit or situation for developers when they bring in pro bigger, you know, larger lots or properties to the city to not cut all their trees down. I don't know if there's any way we could do it that way versus a regulatory. So. Um, yeah. I'm interested in the larger scale. That's where I see the abuse happening. I really don't see so much, well, I mean, you know, in the McLaughlin neighborhood or our older neighborhoods. Yeah. I'm very much in favor of the Natural Resources Annexation Project. That's the one I've been pushing since I first heard about it. Because um, I think that that's th the one that helps us. You know, I scout my property, then I want to come in. I, I think that, that, and I think the planning staff talked about, um, you know, how do you know about that? How do you mitigate it? I think you just, out, I mean, I think the neighbors know. Um, that and I would love to halt that process. You um, and I think those two policies from Lake Oswego and, and um, Wilson Wilsonville address those and would protect us. Um, you know, you you scalp it, but you got to mitigate if you're going to come in for a permit. I think that's easier to regulate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But Rocky. You have to apologize for my voice tonight, but. Um, I agree with Doug as well, and actually everybody um, that spoke <laughs> tonight. Um, I do think we need to look at um, Lake Oswego's policy. I, I know um, a little bit of Lake Oswego's policy, and I think there's some really good elements in that. Um, I think this is becoming uh, more of an issue year after year. Uh, I don't remember. Um, well, I guess it was when the George Abernathy Elm <laughs> started was my first feeling as a citizen that, wow, this is not something that I like to see happening. Um, there was a lot of other issues with that tree, but um, it seems like almost every day um, going around Oregon City, realizing as you know, growing up in Oregon City, seeing these trees that were always there, uh, and I even mentioned this at the Bank of the West, the big tree that was there on the corner on, um, on Malala um, when they moved the bank. Um, I just kind of forgot and I drove and saw that and I was like, where's that tree? It was one of, just an amazing tree. Um, so I do think it is an issue um, that we need to look at um, and focus on, um, but it's going to take a little bit of time, I think. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Anyway. Well, this, I mean, this, this, I, I move on. This, this plan, though, this is a, we're talking about these. This is the code changes to the comprehensive plan. So that's why we're we're putting them in here. This is a five-year plan that we're talking about. So if we intend to do something in the next five years, that's that's why we bring it forward. If if we don't want to do anything, that that's that's uh, that's the decision that'll be made. But that's why it is bringing it forward. Okay. All right. Let's. Uh, Commercial rezoning in South End area, and again, t um, you know, to stay true to our planning uh, program, and that was to be able to uh, ensure uh, walkability, uh, ensure less d uh, car miles. Um, this is one area that is unfortunately in a position that that we can't do anything about unless we do some rezoning and start looking at that in the future, and that's. Uh, and uh, as it said in 2004, we attempted to rezone the area, and it, that didn't that failed. And we want to move forward. And, and do we want to move forward? That's the question. That's one area that is way outside the, the the boundary, or that's at the edge of the boundary, that really needs some commercial development. If if we want to stay true to our planning, I'm very much in favor of this one. And in fact. Um, at those hearings, I rem remember them very well. The South End uh, neighborhoods were very vocal about this. However, when uh, green and sustainable development 
began to be the vogue, and as gas prices raised and they realized how far they were from commercial outlets, a number of those people have really changed their tune. I think that would be way more accepted in the South End area na that now than it was then. That was our feeling. I, I think it's a good idea, too. I think the area you we probably ought to look at is the area that would be attractive for people to visit. And, uh, you know, a lot of that area... Uh, further to, further along South End Road but towards the towards the bluff, mm -hmm. I think would be an area that would be ideal. I mean, people yes. could go there; they get this great view. Yep. A lot of that, uh, you know, a lot of that isn't built out at this point. So, uh, I'm in favor of it. But I, I think we got to look at an area that would be the most attractive to pull people into. Sure. It wouldn't be necessarily along South uh, along South End Road itself, but perhaps someplace else that people would just like to go to because it's attractive. Sorry. I'm trying to talk. I'm trying to talk faster. Sorry, Doug, not taking your mic away. Um, I, I'm in support of this issue as well. And from, um, you know, we've all been receiving emails lately about the south or the bus lines being dro dropped out in the South End. And this might be another thing on their density and you know a core area to keep some of their bus routes. So, so I'm supportive of doing this. I'm just wondering, as part of um, this rezoning process, um, that. Um, whatever commercial development happens there could be guided by some um, architectural design guidelines. Um, I mean, it's fine to um, you know, it's fine to rezone something commercial, but I don't know if the citizens in that area would appreciate just any kind of little strip shopping center going in, and I think they would want some something that they would find compatible with uh, with their neighborhood. Okay. Yes. Any other comments? All right. That sounds. Uh, we'll move forward on that one. Then next is uh, temporary accessory structures, and th th I guess the question is, you know, we've got them off the main front of the of the building, but there are many that are on the side of the building and in the back of buildings, and they're made of fabric, and and we have got some serious code problems with people filling them with trash, and we and it's very difficult for staff code compliance to take care of that if we don't have something in the code to to help with that so that's something that I we we as a, a body wanted to move forward and see if uh, we come up with some agreement anyone object go for it go for it there we go I don't conversation. <laughs> you always get the good ones. That, you wait to put the good ones until the end of the meeting. <laughs> and they, just, they blow through them. You know, this only took us like four years, so I just want you to know. We appreciate your hard work. Amendments to the sign code. Uh, this is probably going to be the most uh, contentious issue is, and whether we want to, uh, number one, it's going to be a huge staff time investment uh, for us to go out and in, and reinvent our sign code. And there's going to be uh, many, many hearings that we'll have to go through. Um, it's really more, I think everybody wants to do it and wants to look at it, and certainly all of this body did. But it was a matter of do we have the, the do we want to invest the time now to do that? One piece of information, uh, the sign code actually is not in our land use section of our municipal code, and so it's not subject to measure 56 notice requirements. So it does not have to be part of this process. It can be done through a parallel process. Because uh, we've already sent our Measure 56 land use notice to 10,000 homes. Uh, so ideally, anything that's inside Title 16 and 17 needs to be within this process. But because our sign code's in Title 15, it, it does not have to. So it can kind of be a separate uh, process. Okay. There we go. Oh, here, Doug. Hear that. I guess Larry's first. Sorry, didn't see him. Okay. <laughs> well, I just simply going to say is, is it a sign code issue or is it an enforcement issue? Of our current code. They said, I, well, I think it's code. That's what they were saying, that we did not enforce the new development. I agree with, uh, with, uh, with the chairman because uh, when we have sign variances come before us, it's always. Uh, the, the idea of having a restructured sign code always comes up, so I, I guess it has been a priority for the planning process. Oh, you want to go next? Um, 
I believe that the new Main Street program is um, their design committee is looking at some sign things. So I would like to hold on this and maybe as Main Street works on, and that's all encompassing a lot of the signage downtown, maybe we could look at this whole issue at another point. Just my two cents. Well, the, but the point is if they are looking at sign issues, they're going to run up against this, this code and they're going to have problems. And they, they, you can have, you know, this code allows things that we don't necessarily think should be in a historic di district. You, you, we, should, we don't believe you should have uh, lit signs necessarily in a historic district next to a home, but we allow it, and and we've always allowed it. And you know, it's it's real frustrating for the historic review board. It's very frustrating for neighbors, and of course, in a historic area, to see these new modern signs go up in a historic district. And, we, and again, it's a sense of place, and I think that's really what started to drive this discussion eight, ten years ago. And it continues to it continues to fester, and I just think something has to be done. And I think we need to start talking about it because we'll, if we don't, we'll I won't be here, <laughs> and you know most of us won't be if by the time we fix it. I think your I think your statement was just hold off on it until the right. Main Street program has a chance to talk about it, or at but least work maybe maybe what Tim is saying is correct, and maybe that um, the Main Street, Street really can't do anything. Uh, yeah, functional issues. until we have yeah. some of these larger issues. So maybe we should work on it together. And if since it is that isn't a land use item, maybe we could. I don't know when we have time in our schedule to do it. But we're talking about process. Process. Uh, I, I want to talk about a how-to. Oh, okay. Because I think you do bump up against with many of these. This is it a new program issue, uh, and it's not a new program if you're funding it through something other than a general fund. And there's a way to do that. In the budget process, I will be talking to you about a more proactive code, code enforcement. enforcement. There's some additional fees that's going to go with that to do that. The sign issue is even more problematic because it's big. But the way you, if you really want to have a good sign program is that you charge an annual sign fee. And that pays for your enforcement oh, effort oh, around that. Yeah. Now, all of that is going to be contentious. The part I can't figure out what the cost is going to be is the legal cost because you are going to run into some ongoing especially in the beginning until you get this in place and then once everyone adjusts to it you'll see that taper off that's normally what happens in communities go through that so there's a way to do these but if we're going to do them and take them on you have to be willing to put in place the funding mechanisms so that's what I'm going with. Because, okay. because funding out general fund you will bump up against that pledge so we're over our time here can we move on then to the last piece we, we can. I'm going to turn that back to you. I just um, we talked about the natural resources. So the, policy, the so. sign code, the kind of direction to staff on that one is that something you want to? I think I kind of see. Yes. Okay, hearing yes. To, okay. What did you say? Yes. We need to recognize there's two issues: the part that Larry just spoke of, and then there's the code itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think you said that we don't have strong enough code for new development. And mm -hmm. I think that I heard nod, mm -hmm. saw nods yeah, all over. Okay. So I'm, I'm seeing, okay, okay. okay. And then finally, uh, attachment D is a conservation easement uh, assessment application that is controlled by state law. Um, it is a uh, program that is uh, outside of any kind of land use process. Um, if you have a, you have to be a qualified organization that holds the conversation, conservation easement, which could be the city or it could be an agent's agency you can't grant a conservation easement to yourself uh, under this mm -hmm. under this provision but it does allow anybody who has a significant piece of habitat or wildlife habitat area to uh, protect it and get a lower tax assessment on that parcel assuming the city or the agency signs off on it um, and uh, that would be in addition to any land use regulation incentive or flexible setback or density transfer that exists under a development application. Mm -hmm. so, right. um, <coughs> Doug? Yeah. You know, I, I mentioned that specifically in terms of developed properties, but you were talking about, for example, uh, the capability of uh, reducing lot sizes, protecting rows of trees in the, in the, in the code. Uh, my, my question to that is, do we want to have this fall under the same kind of agency uh, to deal with it? Otherwise, how is it going to be, in fact, protected? If it, if, it, if, it belongs, if it belongs to the development as a common piece of property, I'm not sure what kind of protection it really has. Well, there will, as part of the land use process, let's say a, a 
Grove was created as part of a subdivision where you you did some density transfers within the subdivision to get this this grove. There'd be some covenants put on that as part of conditions of approval about when trees can be removed. Now, the problem is, uh, you know, long term upkeep of that is always the question. Yeah. Uh, but this is is and there may be a way to bring this in. Uh, the other option we really see from this one is maybe the a uh, lot of record that backs up to High School Creek and has, you know, 50, 60 feet that is on the hillside mm -hmm. that is unbuildable. Mm -hmm. Th this is a great use for that to acknowledge that have protection and have a reduction right. and uh, taxable value. You know, that there is a taxable value. Qu question is you know, how much uh, how much money impact would this have on the city? Probably not that much because very few people probably would go through the process to get the easement created, go find that third party process it and and have the tax the taxes assess, assessment redu reduced but it is definitely an option yeah and it is also conservation easements written into the proposed natural resource overlay district code as a as a requirement mm -hmm. for a trial. Okay. so it's a possibility mm -hmm. but, right but now. you yeah. mentioned you mentioned a covenant uh, this would be a city enforceable covenant correct and okay. we do that today in in, sub in subdivisions and and we've, we've been probably doing it for a couple of years now uh, like if you're doing mitigation trees and you're doing this that as part of a subdivision we may have a covenant being placed on those trees we would expand that into a track s format whereas the trees can only be removed if they're diseased or dying and things like that what kind of incentive? I mean, you've, you've talked about the development reducing its lot mm -hmm. size, and there may be some benefits to mm -hmm. the financial, but what kind of incentives are there otherwise for doing this? That is, are we, when we do our zoning, are we going to identify areas in which this is, in fact, a, prefer, a preferred development? The, the, the issue, I mean, the issue, one of the big issues to me is what we've seen in some of our developments where there were, there were 95 percent of the trees were within the building envelope. Right. We didn't protect them, and given you know, given the type of housing there, I been, they weren't going to reduce their lot size because their lot size is already minimum anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, I would like to have a mechanism that is a mitigation for trees that are cut down in the in the building envelope oh, anyway. We do, we do have that in the new code. Um, okay. In the code that's current today, we have a tree uh, matrix based on the caliper size of the tree, yes. and if you remove it outside the building envelope, what, uh, how many that's mitigation it. trees? We have it. Uh, now we have a, a, a percentage. Of, I think it's half the table. Yeah. A third of the table. Um, so you will now be mitigating to a smaller extent inside. Uh, the building envelope, and then if, if you're moving trees outside the building envelope, you'll you'll have a higher mitigation. One, one thing, I, I mean, the mitigation I think mm -hmm. is the planting of trees, but yeah. I but think it's also the calculation of do I want to spend the money, and and that's sometimes for a developer, clearing the whole site is easier if, <coughs> if I'm not if, it, if it's not going to cost me any more. But if I know that I may have to mitigate with 15 trees, yeah. I may plant around that tree okay. and, and not grade it out. But my, my, my point is this, you're mitigating for tree, tree replacement someplace else, okay? Uh, I'm, I'm sure there are a lot of areas we can do that, but uh, there might be a limited number of areas in which we could do that. We also have I, a tree bank. Well, that's, uh, a tree bank is a good idea, but I think the tree bank should include more than the planting of trees. It should, it, it potentially should be a potential funding source for yes, actually, it is. It is. It, for, or right for, for actually keeping invasive species out of a grove, for example. Mm, now, now that's, what I, that's what I'm right, thinking about. Right. More, than, more than the trees is actually a, used as a habitat preservation fund as well. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Got to wrap up. Uh, Larry. Just, I think it's important since we have everyone here, and again, I, I do have to remind everyone of the budget reality that we're faced with here. Uh, everything we've talked about tonight is a lot of new initiatives, or at least additional cost. And because of two things that are occurring in the area of community development, that subsidy is really going through the roof and looks like it's going to continue to climb. We've had a decrease in revenues from uh, building and planning fees, and we have uh, many more requirements of things we want to do as well, many of the things you're talking about here this evening. 
the subsidy to the uh, community development fund this next year appears to be in the neighborhood of nine hundred and seventy two thousand dollars that's a seven hundred thousand dollar increase from last year uh, that is an entire department being added to the general fund. That does have long-range implications. Now, because we've taken the budget step we have, we're in a process that we can absorb that. But I think it, we are getting to the reality that we're going to have to begin to think about the initiative we want to take on. Mm -hmm. uh, because if that continues to grow like that, it will push everything else out of the general fund. Uh, so that's something that you're going to have to think about when you start thinking about things we won't. Uh, now, again, some of these things we've talked about tonight, there are some other ways to create funding sources to help those, but that increasing escalation there is a growing issue. Okay. Staff, you have questions? you got everything? you got answers that you need? And well, we got fuzzy numbers. places. Yeah, well, I think we have our numbers. Uh, can we pass them off back to both commissions to see if there's an agreement? We have tree preservation policy addressed in a separate process. Commercial rezoning in South End address in current amendment process. Temporary accessory structures address in current amendment process. And amendments to sign code address in separate amendment process. And both the annexation policies and easements, they can be done in a separate process because they're not based on ordinances. Oh, Just to clarify, I heard that the natural resource annexation policy would, would trump the tree preservation policy. So you want to do well, this during hear, this adoption? I didn't hear general consensus around the tree preservation yeah. policy at this time. I think that's was why that's, it does, and I'm hearing that wrong? Right, yeah. that's why we have separate process. Yeah, we're not going to do it. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got it. Oh, sorry. Okay. And then I guess the Thank natural you. resource annexation policy, we, we can have it ready for, why don't I guess? We can draft something for you at an upcoming work session. Yeah. And the adoption process yeah. copies that we yeah got. it's not bound by this process it can happen okay good. Yeah. right so we're not we're, we're okay on this process yeah. that's what I was concerned about so I think we're all right okay well again thank you all very much we appreciate you coming and uh, being a part of this discussion it's important and we look forward to having more of these this is I think something we need to do more of yes yes and it's nice to have a firm that we have the same vision for the community uh, that that's really nice and uh, again appreciate your service it's it's very important so and shall we take a five-minute break while we clear and move into the work session because we need to get on with the show. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.